Uh, my honor to introduce Seth Bordenstein, uh, coming to us from Penn State University. Uh, Seth is the Huck Endowed Chair in Microbiome Sciences, the Director of the Microbiome Center, and a professor in the Departments of Entomology and Biology. Um, Seth did his undergraduate, master's, and PhD at the University of Rochester in evolutionary genetics. Uh, he focused on endosymbiosis, which he will talk about today, so I don't want to give any of that away. But um, he uh, did a postdoc at the MBL at Woods Hole, um, and then he transitioned to being faculty there as well as at Brown University before moving his lab to Vanderbilt, where he was for the last 14 years. Um, at Vanderbilt, Seth continued his work on Wolbachia and symbiosis and uh, went to uh, increased levels of detail in terms of the cellular, genetic, and molecular mechanisms that he's going to discuss today. Um, he also did some really interesting work that he's not going to discuss on the human microbiome, as well as, uh, actually, I don't know how much phylosymbiosis stuff you're going to get into. Not today. But um, uh, at the lunch uh, um, after this, uh, it'd be um, a good time to ask him about those other projects. Um, and uh, Seth has accumulated I, his resume, uh, his CV, it's like the list of awards, it's like pages in there. So I'm not gonna go through all the awards, um, but he's been recognized not only for uh, incredible research excellence, um, but also outreach. And I just wanted to highlight that, um, that he's got this really cool project um, uh, based on some NSF initiatives to do Wabaki research in K through 12 classrooms. And um, he's been recognized numerous times for that work. Um, he's also been recognized numerous times for his mentoring, and um, I'd say that uh, in the grad students' postdocs at the lunch, um, Seth gave me some really helpful advice when I was applying for jobs, um, and he could give you that advice as well, um, so plug him for knowledge. Um, uh, and um, so uh, with that, uh, I don't want to give your talk away, so I just want to uh, welcome you up here. Thank you so much for making the trip down. Um, Seth has just recently moved to Penn State, and uh, I think might be new opportunities thinking about uh, connections with Carnegie Penn State, um, and so uh, other good things to talk about uh, while Seth is here. So um, with that, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for making the trip. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, so you all are very lucky to have Will here as a faculty member. He's, uh, his science I've admired, so um, uh, I, I am deeply appreciative that I'm a little closer to Will, just two and a half hours uh, up the road, really. So look forward to more interactions. Our labs are already collaborating, thankfully, and uh, continue to discuss opportunities between uh, Carnegie and Penn State. Okay, so um, let me start where this story really begins. So it's about 100 years ago, and a graduate student named Marshall Hertig and a, and a professor named uh, Bert Wolbach at Harvard University were looking under the microscope and opening the reproductive tissues up of mosquitoes and various other insects. And at that time, they saw a rod-shaped bacteria inside ovaries of various types of insects. And first of all, you know, seeing rod-shaped bacteria in the ovaries was not really expected at that time. So it was a little abnormal. They saw it in uh, just a handful of insect species and said, hmm, this is a little bit more common than we thought it would be. Rather, this type of organism is one or more or less generally distributed throughout the whole group of arthropods. And well, wasn't that prophetic? Because if you march forward to the 1990s with PCR technology coming on board into entomology labs, and all of a sudden, a lot of insect biologists and other arthropod biologists find that about half of the world's biome is estimated to have these Wolbachia bacterial symbionts inside them. So obviously, Wolbachia is named after Wolbach. And I just do want to pause and reflect here that this is very much a, a parasitic bacteria with maybe some mutualistic offputs. And so by and large, um, if you were to take sort of half of the world's arthropod species and say that 85% of uh, all animal species are arthropods, and therefore half of those have Wolbachia, you're talking about one of the greatest pandemics in extant life today. So never mind coronavirus in humans, Wolbachia in arthropods really takes the prize for being in millions and millions and millions of animal host species. I'll tell you a lot about why it's so successful and how we're using it as a harmful bacteria to do good for controlling human diseases. So this is a, a parasitic wasp that we've studied since I was a graduate student. It's called Nasonia. And much like Hertig and Wolbach, if I were to rip open the reproductive tissues, I'd also see Wolbachia here. This is Wolbachia. It's about a half to a micron in size. 
very granular uh, in structure. There's not much to see except a lot of uh, membranes around Wolbachia in this particular image. And that's because these are host-derived, uh, often Golgi-derived membranes around this intracellular Wolbachia that lives in the cytoplasm of its insect host. So effectively, it cloaks itself uh, with these uh, animal-derived, host-derived membranes. I have a question. Okay. Do, they, do those membranes contain the pores? I do not know the answer to that. I'm not sure that's been specifically looked at. Yeah. Um, Wolbachia do affiliate with the Golgi and uh, are presumptively acquiring membrane from that particular site. Well, maybe not. This maybe not. not. Uh, so this is the fluorescently stained Wolbachia now, just different colors. So Wolbachia stained in red inside the testes here. Uh, and then Wolbachia we'll stained in orange inside this ovarial that makes the oocytes and, and ovaries in total. Uh, these are reproductive bacteria primarily. So they specialize in replicating and colonizing the testes and ovaries, though they do occur in somatic tissues at lower densities. You can find them essentially all over the body in some insects, including wings and including brains, et cetera. So they can have a lot of physiological effects. But today we're going to focus on the reproductive biology of these bacteria because that's where all the bread and butter is for, for how this bacteria is so successful. So this is an embryo, and this is an embryo of the wasps that we were just looking at. And why I show it here is because Wolbachia are not just intracellular and cytoplasmic, but they are maternally inherited from mother's ovaries to the developing eggs, and then now they're in the embryo. Here shown in that green cocktail of bacteria at the posterior end of the embryo, while the blue uh, wasp DNA are mitotically dividing. Now, this end of the embryo, for those of you that probably know in this department, is where the reproductive tissue cells ultimately develop for, from for various types of uh, insects, including these wasps. So the reproductive tissue cells aren't formed here, but they will form. And that's how Wolbachia essentially localizes early in embryogenesis to get into the adult tissues that ultimately transmit the bacteria. Now, if you kind of go down the matrioshka doll of the symbiosis, you have arthropod, Wolbachia, and then you peer deeper into Wolbachia with some electron micrographs, you find a third entity in this endosymbiosis, and that's a bacteriophage. These particles have icosahedral structures, and shown here where the black arrows are, there's a, essentially an enrichment of these phage particles in what appears to be an act of lysis in real time captured in this micrograph as the phages are exiting the Wolbachia cell that would otherwise have a membrane here. It kind of goes all the way around and ultimately stops about here. Uh, this was some images taken by Michelle Marshall uh, in our lab at the Marine Biological Laboratory where we first started to do some of this work in 2006. This is a Wolbachia cell, granular in structure, a couple of uh, outer and inner membranes around it, no phage activity. But right above it is a Wolbachia cell that looks very different. So this is a, a cell that has bacteriophage particles up towards the top where those black arrows are. There's also pycnotic-like DNA, so densely stained DNA here. That's an indicator of a degrading cell that's undergoing lysis. And it's a little hard to see, but there's a collapsed inner membrane right here from the bacterial cell. It's essentially collapsed from here to here. This is also typical of phage lysis as phages make their way out of a bacteria. They start popping holes in membranes and sometimes they detach and collapse inward. Uh, Michelle also saw what we think are phage-like particles, the same particles inside Wolbachia, but now these are in the extracellular testes matrix and they're right next to the flagellar axoneme of the sperm tail here, just kind of floating around in what might be packets of phage particles, perhaps seeking new Wolbachia to colonize and, 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 and lyse. These are temperate phages, though, so they occur in both the lytic and lysogenic state. Now, Wolbachia are interesting to the public and to science for two very big reasons that aren't the only reasons. The first is this Wolbachia are well known to be released across the world in these sites labeled in blue here to control the transmission of arboviruses such as Zika and Dengue virus. Um, and essentially, what happens here is Wolbachia block the replication of these viruses in mosquitoes. It's a trait we call pathogen blocking. And those mosquitoes, even though they might carry a little bit of the virus in a lot of Wolbachia, when they go and bite a human, there's not enough virus in the salivary glands. And so transmission from the mosquito bite to the human host is deeply inhibited. Um, it may not be 100% inhibition, but it's quite strong. 
So releases have been going on across the world for about a decade to two decades now. This is one of the earliest ones they did in Australia. And this just shows the tick marks of locally acquired dengue cases across time. And then in green is where Wolbachia releases were put out into the northern coast of Australia in this blue region of Queensland right here. And as you can see, as Wolbachia increases, the number of tick marks of locally acquired dengue cases dramatically goes down. Um, this isn't just a one-off experiment now. This has been done across the world. And these percentages reflect the reduction in cases of arboviruses in populations that have had Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes released in their essentially local neighborhoods. This is quite a dramatic event for science, I think, where we are now putting bacteria into foreign mosquito hosts. Things with wings then leave into the field, and you have dramatic uh, reductions in disease burden. Um, so it's 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 still in pilot phases as we learn about the challenges and barriers and risks, uh, but things seem to be going quite well. So this is largely run by a program called the World Mosquito Program, uh, with support from the Gates Foundation and federal governments across the world. Um, essentially, as I just mentioned, you take an Aedes aegypti mosquito that transmits these arboviruses, you put the Drosophila melanogaster wolbachia inside of it, and all of a sudden you get this inhibition. What I haven't told you though is how does this how does this all spread, right? We talked about the phenotype being pathogen blocking, but how do Wolbachia move into a resident mosquito population, take over, and then allow this pathogen blocking trait to essentially be fixed so you stop the transmission of the virus? Well, that occurs in something like this, and this is what the World Mosquito Program does. They'll take months of effort of releasing green mosquitoes that now have the Wolbachia endosymbiont replacing the gray mosquitoes that don't. These are the wild type mosquitoes. And over time, you can push Wolbachia infected mosquitoes to near or complete fixation and render a population that can transmit the viruses to ones that can't. It's just stunning how successful this has been over the last decade. Another major reason if you're on the basic science side of this is Wolbachia have dramatic impacts on arthropod evolution, including the biggest question of, uh, of the arthropods diversity, why are there so many arthropods? And um, it's clear that Wolbachia is playing some role in reproductive isolation between the wasp species that we study shown in multiple colors and species here across the United States, as well as a long list of other insect species. And I haven't told you why yet. I haven't told you why Wolbachia can do this and why Wolbachia can spread in that World Mosquito Program. And they all have the same answer. So there is a phenotype that Wolbachia causes in the reproductive tissues. It's one of the most common. It's arguably Wolbachia's greatest tool in the toolkit, though there are several of them, uh, known as cytoplasmic, because Wolbachia is intracellular and cytoplasmic, incompatibility. And that's when an infected male mates with an uninfected female the embryos die early in development, very early in embryogenesis. We call that the CI cross. Now, if the female's infected with Wolbachia and she mates with this infected male, well, those embryos are viable now. We call that the rescue cross. And that's essentially the, the lethality delivered from the father to the uninfected egg is nullified by the infected mother and the infected egg and restores that embryo to viability again. This punted square will come up a lot in the talk. So just if you don't understand it, ask a question. Um, if you do uh, understand, it, it'll be great for the rest of the talk. Why do Wolbachia do this? Well, it's very transparent. Uh, infected females can reproduce twice as many cases as uninfected females can, right? Because uninfected can't reproduce with these CI in causing males, whereas infected females can reproduce with both. This is how Wolbachia spreads in the World Mosquito Program. It deterministically has this selfish drive system that pushes it from lower frequencies to high frequencies over time. It's also part of the reason why you can get incompatibilities between populations or species of insects and generate this reproductive isolation. All right, what's underneath the hood of the phenotype are cytological catastrophes, if you will. So this is a normal first mitosis, and this is a CI cross right after fertilization. And what's in the middle here is chromatin bridging of the paternal genome. It didn't enter into first mitosis correctly. And as that mitosis is happening, the paternal chromatin shreds while the maternal chromatin are dividing fine. This is, of course, an aneuploid like egg, and it will die early in development. If it doesn't die here, it will usually arrest within two hours. This is another embryo that apparently gets past that first mitosis and has essentially missing areas of mitosis. 
Um, the embryo should have all sorts of mitotically dividing DNA uh, throughout it, and this embryo doesn't. So there's a trajectory of errors that can occur from the first mitosis to about two hours in the development where we see chromatin mitotic problems related to the embryonic death that these embryos experience. Okay, so the biggest questions in this field have largely been from a basic perspective, what is the genetic and molecular basis by which a bacterial symbiont can wield these kinds of impacts on vector control and on basic biological phenomena. And if you were to start with what's the precedent, what's the candidate, we really don't have one. We don't know what a bacterial gene would be for manipulating spermatogenesis and then embryogenesis for the other half of this. It's just really hard to imagine what that virulence factor would be, if you will. In our case, um, we took a unbiased omics approach. This was led by uh, my partner in, in life and in science, Sarah, and a really talented MD, PhD student, uh, Jason. And they did a multi-omics comparison of strains of Wolbachia that cause CI and strains that do not cause CI, coupled with transcriptomics and proteomics. To make a long story short, this Venn diagram really boils down what we got out of this. Right in the middle here are two candidates that differentiated the CI strains from the non-CI strains that are expressed in CI strains and they make proteins in CI strains. These two factors are called CI or cytoplasmic incompatibility factors A and B. And they are linked to a prophage region inside the Wolbachia genome. Now I just wanna pause here and say, if you end up with a multiomic analysis that produces only two genes, you're either dead wrong because no multiomic analysis ends up with just two genes. It's usually hundreds if you've done this yourself, or you might be on the right track. So we went ahead and tested this. Um, the CIF A and CIF B genes are uh, co-localized in the prophage genome that we're showing here. It's called phage Wo. Uh, this phage has very normal architecture, sets of modules encode head, replication, tail genes, base plate genes, et cetera. But it also has a novelty. There is a very large fraction of the genome, about half, that we call the eukaryotic association module. These are genes that will not make a phage particle, but they will potentially interact with eukaryotes, and they potentially may be derived from eukaryotic genes themselves, as we've shown for some phylogenetic evidence that there's been gene transfer events between arthropods and this phage. So that's where the CIF A and CIF B sit. This is their phylogenetic co-divergence pattern. Um, we can group them at least early in the early days to three groups. We now have about five groups. In the early days, these three groups really form tight clusters of exquisite co-divergence patterns between these two genes. So it looks as if these may be functionally interacting based on the phylogenetics here. All right, just to summarize, insects have Wolbachia in the reproductive tissues. It's got a small symbiont genome as typical. It's about a, just over a million base pairs. Yet, this small genome has a lot of mobile DNA in it. Uh, and so that is a little bit unconventional because the textbooks will, will teach us that things like mitochondria and nutritional symbionts streamline their genomes completely of mobile DNA. Wolbachia, uh -huh. so about 20% of the genome can be dedicated to mobile genes, including this particular phage. Uh, inside that phage are these two genes, and these are their predicted domain architectures including uh, in CIF a a nuclear localization signal that we annotated recently, uh, and including two nuclease domains um, that may involve some kind of nuclear processing. So I'm highlighting those as you'll see relevant to the rest of the talk. If these genes are responsible for CI, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about the success of this symbiont across the world, the success of the World Mosquito Program could boil down to something as simple as two genes. So how do we test that? Well, Wolbachia is not genetically editable at this current time, but its host Drosophila melanogaster is. This allows us to effectively simulate an infected male in the Punnett square with a transgenic male that expresses the genes that are from the phage. So let's think about that for a second. We're expressing bacteriophage genes inside this animal fly host, and we're asking it to recapitulate these reproductive modifications that might lead to CI, and that we'll see rescue if this transgenic male is mated to an infected female. We're doing that with a GAL4 UAS system. I know a lot of you are familiar with that here. Key to us is that we're promoting it in the reproductive tissues. So in the testes and ovaries and launching the transgene into the sites that it normally would be expressed in. So we had a team of graduate students and undergraduates here um, who did these first experiments. And I wanna walk you through what we initially saw with the prediction on the left. 
Okay, so this is uh, our standard hatch rate data that you'll see throughout the talk as well. On the x-axis here is embryonic hatching rate, so number of embryos that make it into the larval stage or percentage. And in a typical CI cross, you're going to see zero to 40% embryonic hatching. Here, there's an average of about 20% embryonic hatching in Drosophila melanogaster under our design. In a typical control cross that's compatible, you're going to see a lot of embryonic hatching, almost 100% in a compatible cross. And what you're looking at here is a transgenic male that expresses CIF A. So CIF A on its own can't cause or replicate CI. CIF B on its own can't cause and replicate CI. And we were a little shallow sighted. At this point, we were actually thinking we need to start looking for other genes until we remembered these genes are right next to each other. They have this phylogenetic co pattern. Why aren't we expressing them together? And so we express them together under this GAL4 UAS system at a strong rate, and we get complete, invi nearly complete inviability. Now, at this point, you have to ask yourself is this an artifact of expressing two weird phage genes? or is this CI? And the, really the crux of that matter is expressing these transgenic males to infected females, and lo and behold, that rescues that embryonic inviability. What this indicates is that the infection of the mother sees these paternal genome modifications as Wolbachia or phage-like, as the CI system, and they rescue it, validating that the transgenic system is reproducing something that is wild type. That was a key experiment for us. The flip side of this is what happens on the mother side. And uh, to make a very long story short, we boiled this down to one of the two genes on the father side, the CIF A gene, is also responsible for the rescue on the female side. Here we express CIF A in the reproductive tissues of the female, the ovaries. She launches this essentially into her developing eggs. And when those eggs receive the sperm from modified males, they nullify that paternal defect and the embryo is fine and develops quite okay. So this is that cross here. It's a CIF AB male, which normally has a lot of CI, but when crossed to an engineered female expressing the rescue gene, we can nullify that and it goes back to normal embryonic catching. The same is true for the wild type cross of an infected female seeing these two CIF AB products. And the flip side of that, a wild type male that normally causes CI can be rescued by a CIF A transgenic female completing the whole circle that the transgenic system engineers what's normally happening in Wolbachia. All right, so what do these genes do? What, what's kind of interesting about their proteins? We talked a little bit about their domain architecture. Um, and Dylan, who did the rescue gene work in his undergraduate at MHIP, um, then decided to ask, well, what's essential and important about these proteins? The whole thing, certain domains, unannotated regions, et cetera. So with the transgenic system in Drosophila, we hit the protein with alanine substitutions at each of these four sites for CIF A and each of these four sites for CIF B. Sometimes we did multiple substitutions within a particular region. So a CIF A1 line would carry these alanine substitutions, and that would be different from a CIF A2 line that carries these. And we just walked through the gene to say what's important. And what we know so far is... Why did you choose those particular residues? Yeah, good question. I should have mentioned that. These were the 100% evolutionary conserved <laughs> residues across the domain architecture of the system, as well as some of the unannotated regions. So we're hitting ones that are just look like they're going to be important. Um, trying to figure out if one domain is more important than another, really. Here's what we find without showing you all the hatch rate data. The five prime end of the gene here is essential for rescue. So if you hit those, you're eliminating the capability of CIF-A to rescue the paternal genome modifications. The first three sites on CIF-A are important for CI. The fourth site is not important at all. We can't stop CI or rescue at the end here. What this is really says to me is CIF-A does have this duality life to it. It has a portion of the protein that it dedicates to rescue. And then it has a wider portion of the protein that it dedicates to CI. This might help explain why it's playing what it looks like two roles, uh, one on the father's side to induce the modification and one on the female side to then rescue that modification. Um, there could be processing of the protein that we don't fully appreciate why there's this division of labor. All right, on the CIF-B side, because this is only associated with cytoplasmic incompatibility, anywhere we hit it, whether it's an unannotated region or an annotated region, it inhibits the ability of this protein to contribute to CI, so we get no CI. Okay, 
So this really lines up with the phenotypic data quite well. And now having done the genetic work, we really wanna know what's the mechanism of CI. We know they make proteins. We know the regions of those proteins are relevant to rescue and CI. So what is the cell and molecular biology by which these phage proteins launch an attack on essentially animal gametes and embryogenesis? And the question we've been looking at over the last couple of years is how do the proteins impact paternal sperm chromatin before fertilization in the testes? We really want to know what's the incipient step to deliver this paternal effect lethality that kills the embryos. This is uh, on the top here, our control embryos developing from zero to one and a half hours in the progression of mitosis and patterning of the nuclei. On the bottom here are CI embryos that are defective. You get early mitotic failure. You can get chromatin bridging not only at the first mitosis, but also in subsequent mitoses. It's a little hard to see in these. Um, and then you just have regional failures where mitoses just appear to be absent in some spots of the embryo. Now, the transgenic system and the wild type CI system show both these traits. So the trans genes mimic these mitotic and chromatin uh, catastrophes for the embryo. But again, where does it all start? And we have looked at the testes with antibodies for CIF-A and CIF-B to essentially get a window into where are these proteins made during the beginning, middle, and end of spermatogenesis in flies, and what marks do they leave on the sperm genome potentially to deliver the paternal effect lethality. And again, remember the CIF-A and CIF-B genes are phage genes with nuclear localization or activity, so you might expect them to be in the nucleus. Okay, so Brittany and Rim developed the antibodies, fine-tuned them, and started to do these visualizations. And uh, really what comes to bear is there is nuclear localization of CIF-A and CIF-B in the spermatocytes and in the round onion spermatids. It also looks present in the spermatogonium for CIF-A, and it's a little bit hard to tell where the signals are in the apical tip. It's a bit of more of a cytonuclear patterning here. So it may be that they progress from cytoplasmically expressed to the nuclear entry during the middle of spermatogenesis. This is what they look like at the canoe stage spermatids. That's when they start to essentially get their, they're beginning to form their needle-like structure of the sperm. They're going from round to needle-like. And you'll notice that the CIF-A and CIF-B proteins are at the tip ends of the sperm, uh, perhaps in slightly different locations. Uh, a almost seems to be around the sperm a little bit, whereas B seems to be on the tip of the DNA of the sperm. At the needle spermatids, so this is sort of the final stage of development, um, we can't detect the CIF-A and CIF-B signal. It's not that they're lost, it's just that the sperm are so densely packed that if we decondense them with a chemical reaction, we, we can recover the CIF-A and CIF-B signal again. When we do that, CIF-A is more scattered across the tail of the sperm protein with a little bit of localization at the head, sort of one out of 10 tissues might have CIF-A at the head, but most of it's now scattered on the tail. CIF-B remains at the head in these uh, decondensed mature sperms. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have mutants that impact some of these predicted domains, including the nuclear localization signal. So we can express these transgenic proteins like CIF-A with a nuclear localization sequence, but we hit it with a mutant that lacks it. And when we do that, we can disrupt that nuclear localization. The protein is now cytoplasmic, and you might think that this has a deleterious impact on the ability of the system to cause CI, and indeed it does. So the mutation now renders uh, CI inhibited, essentially. We get compatible normal embryonic hatching levels once we disrupt that nuclear localization. Not only does CIF-A impact CI's ability, but it also impacts rescue's ability. Rescue is inhibited on the female side when we use that same mutant. In other words, nuclear localization is essential for CI and it's essential for rescue in the testes and ovaries where these are primarily expressed. So some sort of processing must be happening inside the testes in order to establish these, these um, phenotypes. Okay, what are those modifications uh, for what we're you know, thinking about is just paternal genome integrity at this point. And a classic conserved process in spermatogenesis throughout animal life is the histone to protamine transition, which essentially turns our round developing sperm cells into these needle-shaped uh, sperms. 
It's happening at the canoe stage uh, and fully developed by the needle stage. Early in spermatogenesis, histones tend to dominate the developing sperm. And then later in spermatogenesis, at this transition point, with a little bit of DNA damage, the sperm switch over to a more protamine-based composition. Okay. So we're asking, is this particular transition altered by the SIF expression of these proteins? For histone removal, if you look at uh, the key stage where the histones are typically removed, so this is an uninfected fly, which we call WML minus, stained with a core histone antibody, its histones are largely removed. But in the CIW cross, that's the cytoplasmic Wolbachia, and in the transgenic males, histones are retained. Over, and I'm showing this over what is the DNA or DAPI stained uh, states of these sperm. So histones are retained. This, these two states are the lethality uh, sperm that deliver the paternal effect lethality, and they have a high amount of histone retention quantified over here. So the WML plus uh, Wolbachia has a range of modifications. It is a little bit less of a CI inducer than the transgenic system, which we can push to higher levels, but there's also a little bit of dichotomy in the data. So the average is generally higher. We have some points here that we don't know exactly what's going on yet on why they're not all carrying the histone retention, but on average, the histone retention associates with the ability to cause CI here and the inability or no CI here. All right, so that probably means there's consequences for the protamine deposition, because if histones are retained, protamine deposition may be deficient as well. So we can use a simple stain for that called the CMA3 or chromomycin A3, which essentially is binding to DNA at the same sites that protamines normally bind to. So what that means is if you have an intense CMA3 staining, that means there are deficient protamines there. That is the fluorescent stain gets to the site instead of the protamines. So there's an inverse correlation here. The higher the fluorescent stain, the more protamine deficient you are. So here's the control uninfected WML minus. Mm, protamines are normally there. That's why the stain isn't strong. But in the two CI states, protamines are staining quite, or protamine deficiencies are staining quite strongly and significantly different uh, in these two states, the CI states of the Wolbachian and transgenic males as opposed to the uninfected ones. Okay, so these are correlations at this point. Uh, the histone and protamine transitions clearly altered by Wolbachia, clearly altered by the expression of these SIFs. The controls don't show this. Is it causal though, or is it just more of an association? Um, this we tried to peer into with a Drosophila mutant that has a couple of protamine genes knocked out. And in these protamine mutants, you expect to have more protamine deficiency because those protamines aren't made and therefore not going to be deposited at the same rate. And indeed, our two states of the uninfected protamine mutant and the Wolbachia infected protamine mutant tend to have higher protamine deficiency than when we have the wild type strains that are uninfected and infected. Um, the reason I'm also showing this data is because these two crosses are intriguing to us. It looks like the WML minus. I'm sorry, the WML plus wild type Wolbachia strain causes a little bit less CI than the protamine mutant plus Wolbachia strain. And that implies then that the protamine deficiency is causal to inducing CI. That is, you combine the deficiency of the genetic mutant and the deficiency of the CI Wolbachia in this cross here, and you get lower hatch rates than if you just have Wolbachia alone. Now, the protamine mutant on its own can't induce CI. So there's something essential about Wolbachia doing its business coupled with the protamine genetic background that causes the CI to be lower. Yes, question in the back. Um, I'm wondering if uh, protamine derived, mutant derived embryos show the same chromosome like paternal gene uh, during early mitosis. You're right. There is a lag of the uh, of histone deposition on the paternal chromosomes from the mother. So, so do you see maternal chromosomes segregated correctly and paternal yes. genomes? It's a mess. On. Yeah, it's a mess. Exactly. I'm wondering whether the phenotype from you know, embryonic embryo numbers extends to uh, carry, carry type behavior. Generally speaking, yes. Um, and there's probably a lot of details I could go over with you about how do we map that variation of let's, as you can tell, these crosses produce a lot of variation in CI levels. So could we map that delay 
in embryo cytology to the amount of CI we see here. That would be a nice fine level resolution. I can't answer that yet, but at a broad scale, definitely so. Okay, so the next question is, is what are the CIF proteins doing biochemically? And we're actively working in this area. I don't have a ton of data to share to you, but I do wanna highlight one nascent result. Um, again, remember that the CIF-A protein has a nuclear localization signal, that's essential, and the CIF-B protein has these two um, domains implicated in nuclease activity. So we have purified the proteins out and done in vitro enzymatic activities of the CIF-A and CIF-B protein by exposing those purified proteins to oligonucleotide substrates for single-stranded DNA and double-stranded DNA. And we just give them in test tubes to CIF-A or CIF-B and ask, are they cleaved or not? And in the absence of EDTA, the reaction goes fine. In the presence of EDTA, which binds ions and chelates and ultimately stops the reaction, you can see the controls are producing normal oligonucleotide sizes. But in the presence of CIF-A and CIF or CIF-B, single-stranded, double-stranded DNA is degraded indicating that both CIF-A and CIF-B, at least in vitro, can act as nucleases, perhaps linking it back to the activity we just talked about, those domains. In terms of RNA, this is also unexpected, but we wanted to try it. With a single-stranded RNA oligonucleotide, CIF-A appears to be an in vitro RNase, CIF-B is not. And so this ultimately qualifies, at least in these assays, as CIF-A as a DNAs and RNAs, which would be highly unusual uh, to have that coupled ability, and CIF-B is just a DNAs. How does this all relate back to the model? Well, I mentioned that there's DNA damage here at the paternal uh, histone to protamine transition. And so that DNA damage is actually normal to some extent. It's required to get the histone to protamine transition moving. But if CIF-A and or CIF-B are elevating the DNA damage at this point, it may be part of the process by which it's bestowing these histone retentions and protamine deficiencies. So we've looked at that now through a, a microscopy analysis in the testes at that canoe stage of the spermatids where this transition is ongoing. These are the wild type uh, WML sperm uh, stained with DAPI and then tunnel for DNA nicking and then emerge. And this is the uninfected control negative on the bottom. And as you can see, DNA nicking or at least the tunnel fluorescence is elevated uh, significantly with respect to the uninfected. This is the full spectrum of data we've accumulated where the WML plus strain in purple has this elevated distribution of DNA nicking relative to the WML minus control that has this elevated distribution tends to be non-nicking. And that certainly is a significant difference in their distributions. We can do this with transgenic uh, males to recapitulate the trait and ask, is this due to the CI proteins themselves? And indeed it is that the CIF-AB proteins elevate the amount of DNA nicking um, in the transgenic state relative to the non-transgenic state. So it looks like the DNA damage is induced by the CIF-AB proteins, and it may be contributing to this histone and protamine uh, aberrancies. Here's where we are uh, getting to the bottom of all this. Yes, question in the back. So I have questions regarding two last slides. Yeah. You produce proteins in your transgenic work. Can you test that in both approaches um, your mutants? Because for a common of proteins, it's not a common to procure fine with nucleases. Right. Of different kinds, and I'm wondering uh, with um, with your transgenic system, you're in the ideal position to test for the causality yep. of expression of these proteins. Yep. The damage. So I can tell you without showing you all the data that yes, we can link these mutations to an inhibition of the tunnel stain, though it's not 100. percent We have one mutant that should that doesn't cause CI and isn't ablating the DNA activity, and that's in a CIF-A protein. We, that's the one hairball in, the, in our interpretation so far, because if it's not 100%, we don't exactly want to lean into this is deterministically causal. Where we think that it still has the CI ability, it may relate to its RNA activity on the CIF-A protein rather than the DNAs. So we're currently testing that right now. Do you, have you been able to recognize any nuclease domains in your uh, uh, a &B yeah, so there's two types of nucleases that are present. One is the PDDXK, that's present in CIF-B, but we've now newly annotated a QXXY motif that's also a nuclease family in both CIF-A and CIF-B, and we think those may actually be contributing to this as well. And those are, besides highly, uh, under highly selective pressure, uh, 
phylogenies where the team mutated with allergies? I would have to double check. They are conserved in some of the strains that right. we've looked at, but I don't know if in that whole analysis whether they were fully conserved or not. All right, so we have accumulated, I think, evidence that justifies what we call the host modification model, which is really just a reinvention of a lot of ideas that people have had about how this is done, um, which get a lot of more nuanced names. But it emphasizes the fact that CI is launched in the testes and rescue is launched in the ovaries in order to establish the phenomena that we know as CI. So here's what we know. SIFs invade the developing sperm nuclei uh, as early as spermatocytes, SIFs enhance the paternal canoe stage DNA damage. Uh, SIFs change the histone to protamine transition. At this stage in development, the SIF A and B are at the head region, and there's a paternal genome modification in terms of DNA damage as well as histone to proteins altered. Once there's um, once the sperm kind of are at a very mature state, we do see some relocalization of the protein. A appears to have moved down into the tail for the most part, and B remains at the tip. The, the consequence of this, I don't know if it's just an artifact of decondensing the sperm with a chemical reagent for why if A gets loosely uh, attached to the sperm tail now, or there's some biological implication of what CIF-A is doing once it fertilizes the embryo. Yeah. Just trying to get a little, seek a little clarification here, but if you look at a multiple how many of them actually have these CIF genes? All CI strains have them. But but many Wolbachia don't work by a CI. Yep. Or, and it might depend on what species you're crossing them to, whether they can yep. use CI. Most Wolbachia strains and arthropods either have intact CI genes and they cause CI or have degraded CI genes, but still relics present and they do not cause CI. So it is a really nice evolutionary genetic pattern that matches. So it's possible then to say that all Wolbachia CI comes from just two genes. Indeed. That are shared throughout all the different Wolbachia and all these diverse animals. And, and we've tested transgenically many other SIF variants and can often recapitulate CI with those as well. And your studies are mostly with the Nasonia? With this is Drosophila melanogaster. Well, you're using, but Drosophila doesn't have CI. It does. So there's a there was a there were for a long time in the field people were using old Drosophila males and testing for CI and got very weak CI. What we refine that to is the earliest developing males between zero to eight hours or at least within 24 hours can cause strong levels of CI and that's what you're seeing in these graphs. But I thought in the wild Drosophila didn't but all Drosophila don't have Slovakia. Right, that's certainly true. Well, so the CI is a lot weaker. Or there's some other factors that. Many species don't have to deal with. Yeah, Drosophila is a little bit of an oddity in that it uh, it has weak CI after the first day of aging, whereas in other insects, CI is much stronger. But we are using Drosophila in its toolkit with its native proteins to kind of do the most natural assays we you possibly were able to do this all with Drosophila proteins. Indeed, and we've shown the field that you can do good CI assays with Drosophila. And because I, I yeah. read a lot of these Yeah. Yeah, it's still in the literature today. I still see people writing Drosophila is a bad system to do this in, right? And it's like, I look at my data and I'm wondering, have they read our papers at all? <laughs> yes. So the phage is good and bad for the Wolbachia, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's killing, it, it's in the lytic phase, it's killing, um, but it's also protective and, and allows for, for, for spreading. So um, are there defense mechanisms within Wolbachia against the, the bacteria phage? Are there other CRISPR mechanisms or other, other things? And do you think that Wolbachia, the, the, the lack of existing Wolbachia that are actually um, uh, uh, parasite symbionts, um, but lack the, the phage means that um, if a Wolbachia cures itself, it's actually going to um, end up being an evolutionary dead end. Correct, uh, basically on all accounts. Um, so you got it. So uh, there's no CRISPR system in Wolbachia, which is why these phages are probably so successful. It just hasn't evolved yet. If it, if it can, it might. Um, the phages are almost in all Wolbachia, except for the ones that have had such degradation of their phage regions that you just see remnants of them. You don't see the whole phage. Um, so it's a very successful phage. And you're right, if a CI strain spreads to a high frequency and then it loses these genes, it's actually at an evolutionary disadvantage because it can't rescue the common CI in the system. Yeah. Okay. Can I have another question? Yeah, totally. You know, stepping again away from the idea that this is just like one system, 
a lot of Wolbachia genomes. I thought they had other genes that are not the same in all the species of Wolbachia. They have other genes in this host region that, that make proteins that make it into the host and do various things. Certainly, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of biology that happens probably from Wolbachia to host manipulations. Um, we don't have a nuclear invader uh, evidence until we've got this. Um, and we don't have um, evidence of reproductive modifications of those genes outside of the CI genes. And there's a male killing gene that we've discovered as well. May not have evidence, but I mean, some of those genes, for example, have like OTU domains, yep. which are well known and active. That's right. And modifiers of reproductive biology and yep. in the ovary. Indeed. Yeah. I think there's actually a whole plethora of genes and proteins to investigate here, many of which are in that prophage region that we're calling the eukaryotic association module. Um, anchorin proteins, you may recall, you mentioned the OTU domains. Um, so it, it should be a pretty fun, you know, next couple of decades to work on all oh, these. Other of them look rather interesting. Yeah, well, yeah. Let's talk, I think we're meeting in a little bit. Let's definitely talk about that. Um, I'm gonna try and wrap up because I think I've been speaking for 54 minutes. Does that sound good, Will? Yeah, you got time. I got time. How much? We usually try to wrap up by one. By one. Yeah, okay. Okay. Great. All right. Let me um, let me talk to you about mail killing because this could. It sounds like we're having fun thinking about this. So mail killing is a second trait that I call Wolbachia's smart weapon um, because in this case Wolbachia specifically kills male embryos somehow. Now consider this a different phenotype than CI. Um, so CI is a paternally delivered defect. What we're seeing here is an embryonic lethality defect in which males are specifically killed if they are carrying a Wolbachia for mom. Females live. Okay. Why does something like this exist in the first place? There are a couple models that explain why male killing is so successful from a population genetics perspective. One is resource reallocation. So imagine you're in a limited food resource patch and your sister's you're competing with your sisters and brothers. And if your brothers are preferentially killed in the embryo stage, the sisters have less to compete with for those limited food resources. So they will fitten up and they will leave the patch and lay more offspring than the uninfected uh, patch where brothers and sisters are competing with each other. That sounds a little hokey, but in population cage studies done by John Janicki, it deterministically leads to the spread of Wolbachia through populations. Of course, the consequences are quite severe because if a male killer goes to fixation, those females can't mate with anybody anymore, and Wolbachia just kills itself in the end, and the whole population goes extinct. But as a result of those kind of dramatic outcomes, things like mating behaviors can fundamentally change in, in populations of these, of these moths or butterflies, where lek mating normally occurs where females choose which males they want to mate with. But when males are rare, guess what happens? The males get to choose because there's so many females to possibly mate with that they start doing the choosing and lek mating completely reverses. So male killing is just this fascinating selfish phenotype like CI, but with uh, some interesting outcomes such as on lek mating. Well, one of the genes that we had as a, as a potential candidate in our search for CI genes, it's not the two, but there's this other category of eight. Um, we now call WO mediated killing or WMK it's a hop, skip, and jump literally three genes away from the SIF genes, and we call that WMK there. Now, in the strain of Drosophila melanogaster, it's not known to cause male killing. It's only known to be a CI strain. But in a genome that's 99.9% .9 identical to Drosophila melanogaster's genome, this is from Drosophila recens, a mushroom feeding fly, this is a CI and male killing strain, and it has almost an identical copy of the gene. I say this with the caveat that while we're, all of our studies are going to be focused on melanogaster here, and we don't know that it causes male killing, it's highly similar to a male killing strain, suggesting it may have the capacity to cause male killing. This is the predicted domains. They have two helix turn helix domains, which suggest it may be a transcriptional regulator or a DNA binding protein uh, to be determined. Much like we did previously, Jesse Perlmutter, a graduate student in the lab, decided to test this phenotype transgenically. And we test this in from embryo expression. So we're expressing the WMK gene in female embryos and in male embryos and asking, do we get preferential killing of the males? In our hands, we get a, a subtle but significant decrease in the number of males. 
So this is the WMK expressed transgene. This is a control gene expressed. The sex ratio in the control gene is one male for every one female on average. This kind of variation is normal. But when we express it in the, with the WMK genes, we get about 40% fewer males. So some male killing is happening under this WMK expression. And we can actually link the cytological defects of CI, chromatin bridging, mitotic arrest, early weird things in mitosis, also happening in the WMK express lines. And we can do that with a Y chromosome marker that allows us to see which embryos are males, which ones are females, and then link those chromatin defects to the male embryos. So the same fraction of chromatin defects correlates to the same amount of male mortality. So we think we have a direct link there. When you express WMK uh, in developing male and female embryos in the three to four hour window of development, what we're showing here is WMK against a control transgene and asking what causes the male killing. And there's an existing hypothesis in the field that dosage compensation might be involved in it. Now, dosage compensation is just upregulating the male X chromosome so that it equals transcription of the two female X chromosomes on the other side of the equation. So it's a male, largely male-specific pathway that could be targeted by male-killing symbionts like this. Um, so we have uh, two histone markers. One is for DNA damage, and the other is for acetylation that's highly enriched if, with dosage compensation complex activity. In fact, you can see that in this male embryo here, but it's not present in the female embryo. And notably, this dosage compensation complex marker is highly overlapping DNA damage marker here. And that quantitative data is shown on the right here. Under WMK expression, there's a whole lot of correlation between dosage compensation complex marker activity and DNA damage. Whereas on the control transgene side, we don't see a lot of DNA damage, but we still see the dosage compensation complex marker activity. So this suggests that WMK is a male killing gene. To be determined, there's actually a lot more data coming out on this that seems to validate what we found and that it may be operating through this sex-specific pathway. This would also likely be secreted out of the Wolbachia inside a male embryo. It may bind, if it's a transcriptional regulator, to host DNA, for example. It may alter the transcription of a male-specific pathway like the dosage compensation complex and then lead to some kind of chromatin error that kills the embryo. That's our current hypothesis for the future. All right, so with that, I'll just say, uh, currently our knowledge is, is that one of the great pandemics in the history of life boils down to a, just a few genes, these two SIF genes and a male killing gene from the prophage part of this endosymbiont. Those few genes have gone on to ha have major worldwide impacts on various companies using Wolbachia to control mosquito-borne diseases. And these genes impact things like speciation and lec mating from a from an evolutionary perspective. So it's uh, kind of astounding, though maybe not surprising in the end, that a small symbiont genome has a small toolkit in order to do some of these reproductive shenanigans that have led to its such success. I don't exclude that there'll be modifiers and other genes that potentially will assist or enhance or, or inhibit these activities, but they certainly look like they're developing as the causal candidates of, of, of these phenomena. Uh, so with that, I will stop and uh, thank you for your attention and your awesome questions, and I'm happy to take any more. Thanks. Will, should I direct the questions? Yeah, you can direct the questions. I can stand up and do it, but... All right, I'll go for it. Yeah, I'll go for it. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, right there, just because somebody has spoken up. Uh, I have a couple questions, that's okay, uh, but they're related. Uh, I think the speciation part is extremely fascinating, uh, especially because there are so many other pods. Yeah. Um, but the first question is, you mentioned about the SIF genes across all the wall bacteria. Yeah. Am I saying it right? Wolbachia. 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 No. Um, are they recombinant if you have different strains of SIF genes? Because you mentioned that there's some sites that are extremely conserved. Are those recombinant across different strains? Meaning have like SIF alleles recombined with other SIF alleles. Yeah. I, I don't have any evidence for that, but it hasn't been thoroughly looked at either with sort of population genetic recombination programs that would be able to give us finer resolution. Um, Wolbachia are, you know, they, they divide clonally, though there is a lot of movement of these genes by the phage that could offer opportunities for recombination. So it's an important question that we shouldn't rule out that isn't occurring. Because I was wondering if, that was a driver of speciation as well. Yeah. Get specificity between Wolbachia infections. 
Okay, you just hit on something I should say to you at this point, which is if you have divergence in the SIF genes, you can generate a bidirectional incompatibility where one strain is so divergent, it can't rescue the modification of the other strain. And that's what happens in the Nisonia wasp. So we have four species of wasps. They have different Wolbachia infections with different SIF genes, and they cannot interbreed to a full extent unless you antibiotically cure them of their Wolbachia and SIF genes. Yeah. Was there, I'll do it here and then we'll move around the room from there. I think I maybe missed the, the final punchline of cytoplasmic incompatibility. Yeah. So there's this, I mean, these genes that they and that we are responsible for removing the stones, substituting in proteins instead. And then what makes those chromatins incompatible? Yeah. So like, dude, I think that Alex asked if, uh, something about like which, which um, kernel that we ended up having the, 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 the metaphase bridges or anaphase bridges. And uh -huh. it sounded like paternal chromatin. Oh, it's, it's always in the Yeah. It's lacking. And like, what? Tell what's going it doesn't attach to it. Could it might well or like what's the yeah thing? so um so we're at a really pivotal point where we've discovered the genes we know the nascent molecular phenomena that are being altered that is histones are retained on the CI sperm and their protamines are deficient there's some DNA damage we're literally writing the grant for the next five years to kid at what's underneath the hood of that. And you know how this goes in a re very reductionist level. We're just gonna keep drilling down into the finer mechanisms at this point. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to say, but the analogs are when you alter paternal genome integrity in all kinds of animals and you alter the histone to protamine transition in many types of animals, it often leads to sperm infertility. We are seeing that now induced by a back set of bacteriophage genes which can then be, they can rescue that infertility as well. This is a lock and key type process to this thing. Um, and so the finer we drill into what types of um, post-translational modifications are made on the histones, what types of cell biology changes are occurring at a finer level, then we can start to look for analogs of those to other systems as well, such as human male infertility. Yeah, thank you. So was there a question in the back? I don't wanna, yeah. Yes, uh, related to <clears throat> histone deposition. In, in sperm uh, about 10 years ago before um, Karen's lab and others described their retention of histones as, uh, in human and mouse sperm as being important for proper expression of such genes in the embryos. And I'm wondering, A, such a phenomenon has been established to exist in, um, in insects that you're looking at, and how that actually that's true intersects with your findings. I love that idea. I haven't heard of that, which makes me want to go back and test that. Um, no, almost nothing is known about that level of detail as far as I'm aware. And it could set up some of the trans the, the, the transfer of these modifications, right, from father to embryo could be that gene expression is altered after fertilization. I like that. Yeah. Oh. Really interesting seminar. Thank you. But there's one thing about the story that's coming out here that just seems like there's a contradiction. Okay. Because here you have this remarkable system that has invaded, you know, 50% of the insects. You said, well, that must have taken hundreds of millions of years. And it's also in nematodes and probably a kind of undetermined number of other species that just haven't really been studied yet. And yet, it's a very simple two gene system, and we already know it can be modified because you know, it also has a modifier that could just be picked up by species. And so, how can this these two things both be true? I mean, usually it's, you're very quick to evolve, you know, resistance to this kind of yeah. You know, many parasites have used this CI type approach to to spread, even in the plant world. You mean like cytoplasmic male sterility yeah. and things like that? Yeah, it's so, an analog. Uh, with this one, there's got to be something like really kind of unique that sets this parasite above all these others who tried a very similar strategy. And here, this one's just going like, you know, the biggest record of evolutionary success of anything. Yeah. In, you know, there's there's got to be a message there somewhere. There How do you become resistant? so that you're, you can't be evolved against very well? I think that's a great question. You know, is it targeting something so conserved that if 
the host tries to counter adapt, it alters its own infertility. That could be a real explanation for something like histone proteomene transition. Um, so this molecular mimicry is a common theme in pathogens. Maybe that is what's you can just find the most sensitive maybe. part of the host. That maybe can't, host just can't respond. I mean, I'm still astounded. It, it got it gets inside sperm nuclei and does what it does. I and mean, I think that's fascinating. And then if it's targeting something so conserved that it's hard to adapt, what a, what an idea. Um, there's certainly evidence of hosts that have evolved suppression of Wolbachia densities, uh, of Wolbachia CI. So that does exist in nature. And those might offer opportunities to ask, well, what is being inhibited in those particular cases? But on the other hand, I'll, I will counter and say that the phage delivery of these CIF proteins is important to why it products so successful, because you can deliver these CIF proteins in one phage variant they're successful and then the host evolves resistance to them. And then the second phage variant comes into Wolbachia with a new set of SIF genes and it keeps reloading right. the gun, essentially. Just about every bacteria has phage prophages with genes and then it seems like. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And so that's why we have bacteria that are virulent that, that aren't going away, a lot of them are right? Adaptive. I think if you just reshuffle the genetic toolkit and deck of these virulence factors, the infections keep on going. Otherwise, why aren't we as a species just completely, you know, rid of pathogens. And so maybe that the MOBA element pool is just generating that kind of reinvasion dynamics. It's hard to escape it. If the host counter adapts on one type, it can't do it on the second type. I suspect that's part of the equation. Mark. So um, two related things. First of all, you said in your experiment, you expressed mouth killer only in embryo, right? Yes. Um, is there evidence that that's where it's normally expressed? Or yes. If, if it's expressed, during, if, you, if you drive it during oogenesis, do you get a stronger effect? No, I can't. I can't recapitulate male killing by expressing it in oogenesis in the lab. And male killing is known to take place about at zygotic transcription hours. So we're talking two, three, four hours of development or sophila. That's when it's known to kick in. You start seeing these chromatin errors. So all the data line up quite nicely that that's the target, the embryo stage, whereas CI, the target is the testes and ovary stage. And how, do, how are any of these RNAs and proteins getting out of the wall back here? <laughs> there is a type four secretion system predicted in Wolbachia, Irene Newton's lab has done some nice work on showing in E. coli, engineered E. coli, with some Wolbachia proteins from the type 4 secretion system, that it can operate, some of those protein components operate as a type 4 secretion system. That's a possibility. The second is the phage does the job for the proteins. It lyses Wolbachia and then lets the proteins go out of Wolbachia. Yeah. Is there any evidence that lysis is required for um, CI? Uh, there's evidence, there's no evidence for or against it at this point. Yeah, that's a tricky, it's a tricky set of experiments, but yeah, um, I like it. We've thought about it. We've often thought that maybe the phage coat is decorated with the CI and male killing proteins, and then the phages leave with these proteins and they go and do their business from there. Yes. I, um, my question is kind of related to Ross one. So you show that CI happens when a male is infected and is crossed to an uninfected female. Correct. But how do you explain, and, and you said that this depends on the um, non-substituted proteins to histones. But how then you, do you explain the rescue when you cross this male with an uninfected female? With an infected female and you get rescue, right? So this is also a big question for us going forward is now that we know somewhat about the molecular mechanics of these defective sperm, what does the female, what does the embryo do to rescue that? Um, our simplest model, which is, I don't think, I don't think it's foolproof yet, but our simplest model is the modifications that are bestowed on the paternal genome by CIF A and or CIF B are the same modifications bestowed on the maternal genome by CIF A. And so they sync up in synchrony and divide properly because their modifications have been aligned early and right after fertilization. That's our simplest model. Okay. It, that's a hypothesis. It could be fundamentally different mechanics of rescue and CI. But if you want to go for the simplest thing, they're doing the same thing just on male and female side. And that's how the mitosis syncs up. Yeah. Question in the back. Question over Zoom from Bob. Go ahead. Have you looked at the cell, have you looked at cell biology of CIF A and CIF B during oogenesis, either in Drosophila or Nusonia? Yeah, we've looked in Drosophila. Um, it is nuclear localized. Um, 
It is not, interestingly, it's not inherited from oocytes to the embryo. Huh? So un under a transgenic system where we express it in oocytes, we can't see it in embryos. Um, so to us, that suggests that there is some sort of oocyte priming of the rescue system. So the embryos are carrying some other modifications that aren't directly using the CIFA protein at that point in order to do the rescue. And it could relate to the fact that CIFA is in the nuclei of these embryos. It has a DNA and RNA, and so perhaps it's reprogramming the eggs in order to do this. That's where we are right now. Thanks for your question. Anything else? Really fantastic dialogue. Thanks, Ollie. Great questions.